Good evening. Recent events in Peking have focused world attention on China and because of its special relationship with China on Hong Kong as well. Just a few hours ago, British television audiences saw an edition of the BBC's Panorama programme devoted entirely to China. And immediately afterwards, an edition of Newsnight, including a live studio discussion between an audience in London and in this studio here in Hong Kong. We now bring you that programme exactly as it was seen in Britain, free from interruptions. The events in China have provoked outrage across the world and alarm in Hong Kong. In eight years' time, on July the 1st, 1997, this British colony will be handed back to China under the terms of an agreement signed five years ago. There are five and a half million people in Hong Kong, over three million of whom are British subjects, who now, more than ever, want the right to settle in Britain. So far, however, the government has insisted that only a small fraction of them will be allowed to come. Yet now, powerful voices in this country have declared that after what's happened in the last few weeks, the government must think again, that it has an overriding moral obligation to the people of Hong Kong, and that for us, the British, this is a matter of honour. Tonight, we will hear the case from Hong Kong addressed to us and to the Foreign Secretary. In turn, Sir Geoffrey Howe will explain the government's present position, not only to the people of Hong Kong, but to an audience in this studio a cross-section of the men and women of Britain who could tell him to change his mind. Sir Geoffrey, after the bloodshed, a simple question to you. Why are you not now prepared to give to the British nationals of Hong Kong the right of abode here, an insurance policy against what could happen to them? Well, the answer to that directly, of course, is that if one is granting an insurance policy, you have to assume that every one of the policyholders will claim his insurance, all three and a quarter million of them. And it has not been our judgment that one could commend legislation to that effect to the House of Commons. One cannot grant an insurance policy on the off chance that it won't happen. It's very important to put all this in a longer perspective. I noticed in your introduction you said it was to be handed back under an agreement arrived at five years ago. Of course, it's a much deeper problem than that, because the territory was held by us under a lease which expires in 1997 uh, and it was the conclusion of all of us that we had to try and reach an agreement to prolong the prospects of Hong Kong's prosperity beyond that because we couldn't challenge the expiry of the lease and the agreement was one that we drew up after very very long negotiations receiving the close advice of the representatives and, and legislative council in Hong Kong when we arrived at it in 1984 it was universally acclaimed and welcomed as offering the very best prospect for the future of Hong Kong. Now, the tragedy of the events of the last few weeks has been the extent to which all that has been cast in grave doubt, and I fully understand the deep anxieties of the people of Hong Kong in face of the brutality, first of all, in, in, in Peking, and now the widespread and sustained depression. I fully understand that. I fully understand why they ask for what you've asked me about, but in the context of British nationality policy over the years, we do not judge that it would be acceptable to the House of Commons uh, to present them with the proposition that three and a quarter million people should be granted the prospect, which has to be regarded as a realistic one, of coming to this country to settle. Why can you not offer them that prospect? Why would it be unacceptable to the House of Commons? Because if you put it in the context of the whole way in which we've had to develop our immigration policy since the end of the war, when the British Empire first emerged into the post-war scene, there were literally hundreds of millions of people around the world who could claim the right to settle here as of right. And in contrast to countries like the United States, Canada, Australia, which have been in the business of attracting immigrants continuously over many centuries indeed, Britain's task has been to restrict the numbers of people who could theoretically come here. And in 1981, long before this agreement was arrived at, the House of Commons then decided quite plainly that we could not continue to extend to the British passport holders in Hong Kong the right 
of settlement or abode in this country. But Foreign Secretary, you have acknowledged the situation is now different. Indeed, the very man with whom you did that deal, signed that agreement, now has, not to put it too crudely, blood on his hands. He is the agent of the pogrom, of the killing that we saw. He authorized it. So my question to you again is, why under those circumstances can you not say that they can come? And may I, in that context, to direct your attention to one of the things that you said in the House of Commons, ask you why it is so important to you that maybe, and I quote you, it, the result would be to more than double the ethnic minority population of the United Kingdom. This was not to do with numbers, but the ethnic minority. Because the whole fabric of our legislation as it has developed in relation to immigration control has necessarily been related to the people from the Commonwealth who would originally and otherwise obtain the right to come here. And one of the reasons why that control has been regarded not, in, not merely as justifiable, but as absolutely essential, is in order to, main, to minimize the risks of ethnic conflict within our own country. What, you are, saying, what you are saying, with respect, Sir Geoffrey, is that you believe the British population would not tolerate this arrival, that there is enough racial feeling amongst us to make that not a political option. Do I understand you correctly? Let me put it more direct, isn't there? Yes. The whole of our legislation designed to control Commonwealth immigration at one time, a matter of deep controversy, has been accepted by successive governments as a necessary feature in a crowded island like our own if we're not to have the tensions arising from a large, growing and unpredictable ethnic minority. That has been the basis. And if one was to contemplate the possibility, and one has to contemplate the possibility, of adding to that ethnic minority a figure larger than the total already here, that is a, a, a potential cause of social tension, which one cannot disregard. Let me then come back to you again, no less bluntly. What you are saying by inference is that if these people were white Anglo-Saxons, or indeed white Europeans, who incidentally have freedom of access here in any case now as a result of the common market, or will have increasingly, it would be okay. No. It's the color of their skin. No, 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 not in the least, because our Commonwealth immigration changes have progressively affected people regardless of their yes, color. Yes, but you've just defined the problem, not in terms of the change of law exclusively, but in terms of the possible social unrest that yes. follows from it. Now, you're not proposing that there would be social unrest uh, with Australians or Canadians. You're no, proposing but, but, that it's because these people are Chinese ethnically. But, but supposing a, millions of people from any of the other territories were to claim the same right, the same kind of problems would arise. They arise with particular sharpness in this case, and this is the case that was accepted by the House of Commons in 1981. Let me, and let, you, are let, not let, prepared, let, you are not prepared to contemplate, Foreign Secretary, that under these circumstances, what was accepted in 1981 may not be tolerable to a tolerant British society and therefore subject to possible change. Yes, let me again present the thing to you directly. Now, I do not wish to be put here, as it were, being charged or cross-examined by you as I am insensitive to these matters. During the whole of my time as Foreign Secretary, a great deal of my energy and, and effort has been directed to trying to establish a secure prospect for the people of Hong Kong. And I fully understand the depth of their anguish in face of the events that have now happened. I fully understand why they make now the case that they have made in earlier circumstances. But the fact is that to have a case made on that scale would be to test the tolerant hospita hospitality of the British pe public, I think, to a point that it would not be prudent to come into the House of Commons. Now, if we, go, if we go beyond that, we have, of course, indicated, in light of the events that have happened, that there is scope for some consideration within the limits of the existing law on that. We've also indicated that there are other considerations which I know are deeply concerning the people of Hong Kong, namely the pace at which changes should take place in their constitutions there. Uh, so there are many things yet to discuss. Foreign Secretary, I certainly do not seek to charge you with anything. I ask the questions that are in the public mind and have been much aired, as you know, in the editorials of our, most of our newspapers. Uh, let me pick you up on just those two last points you made, particularly the one about changing the present um, uh, arrangements of the Act, the flexibility with which you might let people come in. 
that has prompted the response that, yes, that's fine. If you happen to have enough money, maybe you'll reduce the amount of money. If you happen to work for the government or be a, an ex-service person, yes, you'll get in. But at the end, you're still saying some will get in, but the majority won't. Well, those are the categories under existing legislation uh, which prevail in quite different circumstances, not just in relation to Hong Kong. Those are the categories which already exist and which therefore uh, form the basis from which any consideration but you're not, you're not, you're should, not, should start. You don't want people to, to run away with the idea that this flexibility will increase to the extent that everyone will be embraced. It's still going to be a very small proportion, however you increase those categories. The, the, the conclusions on that have yet to be arrived at. It's a matter for consideration. Very well. But Let I think the, the important point to recognize is that the legislation as it exists was shaped with sensible purposes in mind. I fully acknowledge why people should be seeking to question it now, but I do believe that it would be very difficult to invite the House of Commons to accept a change along the lines and on the scale that is currently being canvassed. As I understand you then, and you've been very unambiguous about it, Foreign Secretary, the concern that one might have, the House of Commons might have about racial tension and racial conflict in this country overrides any obligation in the respect of sanctuary which you might otherwise wish to exercise. Which leads me to one final point before we'll be talking again later in the program. The Prime Minister says we have a commitment to the secure future of the people of Hong Kong. What you really mean by that commitment, if I've interpreted you accurately, is that you can't actually fulfill the commitment in respect of that security, but you hope things will be all right. Well, our commitment has been to Hong Kong, not only to its people, and that commitment, of course, has had to be built upon the inescapable facts of geography and history. Hong Kong, the territory, Hong Kong, its people, are a tiny proportion of the land mass and people mass of China. And it's on those facts that we have sought to arrive at an agreement. Indeed, we did arrive at an agreement with the government of China, an internationally binding agreement, widely acclaimed on which to build the future of Hong Kong. Which in some foreign secretary, and this is not a charge against you, it is your judgment that the House of Commons believes that the British people are too racialist in their outlook to allow the moral considerations about what might happen to the people of Hong Kong to override that concern. Now, I don't accept, if I may say so, that crude and emotional way of putting it. What I'm saying is that any society has a limit to the pace at which it can absorb people, and the more strange they are to the society, the more difficult it is to accept them. Uh, other societies have the same kind of pattern of legislation, and I believe that if the House of Commons is to be invited to extend a commitment to three and a quarter million people from Hong Kong, from a totally different background, then it has to be invited to do so on the basis that they may all claim that right. I know that it's comforting to argue that we can do it as an insurance policy because it may never happen. That would be the height of irresponsibility. We have to address ourselves to the prospect as a reality. And it's for that reason that we form the judgment that we do. There are different ways of saying perhaps the same thing, perhaps different things, for instance.